This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Quick note. Uh, this recording is on two separate pieces that are both quite short and also heavily connected. Both are done by the Solidarity Federation. Part 1. ADHD, Capitalism, and Disability Activism It seems like every couple months, the ADHD community on Twitter has another phase debating capitalism and ADHD. How many of our problems are caused by capitalism, and how many are just a medical condition that will never go away? This tends to end badly with polarization and oversimplification on all sides. But if we step away from that for a second, there are some things worth talking about. A lot of the things ADHDers experience aren't inherent to our condition, and our society could do a lot more to make ADHD more livable. How can we make that happen, and what does it have to do with capitalism or disability activism? Before we start, it should go without saying that ADHD is never going to just disappear as if by magic. And even if it could, capitalism isn't ending tomorrow. In the meantime, a lot of us depend on medication and diagnosis to be able to pay bills and not end up homeless. Utopian thinking, acting like an ideal world is just around the corner, misses the point and means we forget to do anything about real problems in the here and now. Quick footnote. For the anti-capitalists reading this, that does not mean we reject revolution in favour of reformism. It may not be clear from this article, which is a general call to action, but in brief, the difference between revolution and reform is not about utopia versus making small improvements, but the means we use to do so. Direct action and grassroots organising are revolutionary because they tend towards creating a total change in society whereas reformism tends to reinforce the structures that already exist. The difference is the kind of social relationships that each creates. Does the action reinforce passivity and hierarchy, or does it nurture empowerment and initiative? The latter is what defines revolutionary action, so even with a utopian goal, an action can still be reformist. The important point is that revolutionary forms of action make the next action easier to do, they leave behind organizations of empowered people, whereas reformist actions tend to be a dead end. Even if reformism succeeds, the next organizing effort has to begin again from scratch. That's what we mean by reform and revolution. Suggested reading, Fighting for Ourselves. The reason we talk about this stuff is that in order to get anything done, we need to understand the system we live under and that system is capitalism. What I want to ask is, what is the best way to improve our lives? How can we get better access to medication, support and accommodations? Who do we work with to achieve that? Just ADHDers, other disabled people, or something broader? The starting point has to be figuring out why. Why is living with ADHD so difficult? Why do so many people struggle to get diagnosed and access medication? Why are people hurtful towards us? Why do so many of us struggle to hold down jobs and relationships? If it's just a result of mass ignorance and prejudice, then the answer is simple. We raise awareness, and we educate, and in the end the problem will fix itself. On the other hand, if we are kept in this position for the sake of a system of class exploitation, capitalism, then change is going to take a lot more than that. All the awareness raising in the world will not convince the wealthy to give up their wealth. So we would need a different method to advocate for ourselves. While our issues are not all precisely the same, disabled people share a lot in common. We have to struggle to get accommodations at work, or to get understanding at home. Our access to support is threatened every time governments have another round of austerity. One reason waiting lists are so long. Since we are stronger together, it makes sense for people with all kinds of disabilities to campaign as one group on these problems. For example, I'd encourage all ADHDers in the UK to join Disabled People Against the Cuts, 
DPAC if you want to get something done about wait times for a diagnosis. The next question to ask is, what precisely is disability discrimination about in the first place? No human being can survive alone. We are social creatures and every one of us depends on mutual accommodations and support from our community. We have created a world full of adaptions to make life more bearable. Pavements, roads, lighting and so on. But in the world we live in, not all adaptions are created equal. Some needs matter more than others. There are adaptations we expect to be provided. Some of them collectively, roads. Some of them privately, stairs into your flat. The difference between having the adaptations you need automatically or not is what it means to be marked as disabled. When the society we live in treats you as an exception, your needs become disabilities. This is called the social model of disability. No landlord would rent a flat with no stairs and then say, if the tenant can't climb up the walls, then that's their problem, not mine. But as soon as you need a wheelchair ramp, that is exactly their attitude. If it wasn't for the activists before us, this would be much worse. Thanks to them, we can get some accommodations by law, but that only works if you can get a diagnosis and know your rights in the first place. Now, how does society decide what are normal needs and what are disabilities? The particular society we live in here and now is one where a few capitalists own and control almost everything. Pretty much every institution is set up to keep them wealthy. By exploiting the rest of us, working class people for their profit. That's capitalism, and that's a system whose interests determine who counts as disabled. It is a system that depends on dividing us up into neat, manageable units who are all as similar as possible. And it's on us to ensure we conform. So right there, you have the issue of numbers. If your needs are in a minority and too expensive to accommodate easily, you are now disabled under capitalism. With ADHD in particular, it's also about productivity. If we are late for work or go at a different pace, that means less profit for the rich. As a minority, it's often cheaper to just fire us than to make any kind of accommodation. Even better for them is masking, when we exhaust ourselves trying to fit into their standards. Individual accommodations scare them, because they are perceived as disrupting the order and conformity that they have built up. Order that is part of workforce discipline, and therefore profits. That may be why there are so many barriers to getting a diagnosis. Unless we have that hard-worn slip of paper from a doctor, they can say any issues are our problem to adapt to, not theirs to accommodate. This spills over into the world outside of work, into the personal discrimination of microaggressions and meanness. Because capitalism is a system we live under, we have internalized its values and made them our own. Just as they expect order at work, we judge people for having a disorganized and untidy home. Just as they expect us to be on time for work, we feel guilty about being late to meet our friends as well. Some psychiatrists estimate that by age 12, ADHDers get 20,000 more negative messages than other kids their age, leaving behind a lifetime of broken self-esteem. This is the result of growing up under a system that only values our class for how the wealthy can exploit us. Why is this important? Because if disability discrimination is an integral part of a system for making a few people very wealthy, then there is only so far we can go by raising awareness or asking nicely. Challenging individual attitudes is a losing battle unless we address the root causes, nor will it help in the long run to cozy up to our exploiters. That is just what the, quote, ADHD is a superpower, end quote, and, quote, ADHD is not a disability, end quote, discourse ends up doing. It tries to gain acceptance by telling the rich that we can be productive and we can conform while throwing those who cannot mask well enough to do that under the bus. Giving business tips on how to use hyperfocus to exploit us more fiercely is not going to fix the problem. No. What is needed is activists prepared to be a bigger threat to their profit margins than the accommodations we are asking for. That's why the laws we have today come from direct action. In the UK, we had campaigners chaining themselves to buses and blocking roads. That's how we got the Disability Discrimination Act. If you want to cut waiting times and get access to a diagnosis, then we need to organise into groups that can take action and protest decision makers into doing something about it. Once we are organised, we need to make sure that our activism goes further than just winning surface level changes. 
Access to medication is a great start, but many prescriptions are only enough to cover the working day, about 8 to 10 hours. Outside of our productivity, home and family life won't matter unless we demand it. Treatment should include good quality counselling and psychoeducation as well as meds. Diagnosis needs to be part of a free public service and not run by unaccountable corporations who put wealthier patients first. This needs to be accessible to everyone, including the most underdiagnosed, not just middle class white men who always come first under the present system. And that doesn't begin to address issues like incarceration. A disproportionate number of ADHDers end up in prison. The explanation, if it is discussed at all, is, quote, they are impulsive so they commit more crimes, end quote. But how many plead guilty to crimes they didn't commit because of that impulsivity? How many had no choice but to shoplift for lack of income? How many turned up late for court and had the judge turn against them for that? The prison system is set up to maintain capitalist order, and it seems to be punishing many ADHDers for not conforming to that order rather than for doing any harm. This is the kind of thing we need to look into. That sounds like hard work, but there is some very good news in all this. We are not alone. As disability discrimination is part of the system that exploits all working class people, other people have a reason to help us. We don't have to go cap in hand asking for charity. This is about solidarity, about doing what is in the best interest of all of us. That's why, when we campaign for better HGHD and autism services where I live, the health workers union Unison gave us their support. That's why lots of unions in the UK have groups for disabled members, and why some have committed to educate their members about disability. Asking people to join our campaigns is one way to challenge the stigma we face from able people. It changes the narrative we are no longer failures, or weak people looking for a handout, but people who want to stand together with them in solidarity. Campaigns that create relationships based on solidarity challenge the idea that we exist just to be productive that we are only valuable because we are exploitable. The communities we have online are a good beginning. By helping each other, mutual aid, we are already creating that kind of relationship. Now we need to take it further into organising an action. Our ADHD isn't going to disappear no matter what system we live under, but we can make things a lot better for ourselves so long as we are willing to fight for it. If we go beyond if we go beyond raising awareness and put our work into systemic change alongside other disabled people and working class activists in general, then we have a real hope for reducing the suffering and discrimination we face every day. Part 2. We fought NHS cuts to ADHD and autism services, and we won. In 2018, Live Well Southwest, the private company who run mental health services in Plymouth, stopped all assessments for adult ADHD and autism. There was no announcement, and the Devon Clinical Commissioning Group helped to cover it up, ignoring questions and refusing freedom of information requests. However, in October last year, we finally beat them. The NHS agreed to put an extra £500,000 into the service, and we soon heard from people on their waiting lists who had been offered assessments. This is a report from a Solidarity Federation member involved in organising the campaign. The first step, as with any community campaign, was research. I'd heard rumours that the service didn't really exist, but we needed proof of what was happening in order to be able to organise. This was the part of the campaign which took the longest. Emails were ignored and freedom of information questions dodged. Eventually, I was able to confirm the situation by finding other people who had asked for an assessment and been told this service wasn't really there. The next step was to organise a campaign. After getting advice from Bristol Solidarity Federation members who had stopped Virgin from taking over children's mental health services in Bristol, I set about getting a group together. Just like the research, this took a lot of persistence, but in the end we had about 10 people involved in an organising committee that met on Zoom and the chat app Discord. Contacting local disabled people's organisations helped, but most of the numbers came from a university students group and word of mouth. This group sent Devon CCG now Devon ICS, a list of demands, and managed to get on the local radio to talk about it. We also got Plymouth Unison Branch to share our demands on their website, which I think was a big help. Basically, we did everything we could to connect with allies who could help fight this, like mapping a workplace in our organiser training, but applied to the community. List of demands here. 1. A waiting time for assessments of adults with autism or ADHD of 2-3 to three months. 
Until that target is reached, patients should be given the option of referral to another service outside the area or through the patient choice scheme. 2. Any diagnostic service for autism or ADHD should be provided by the NHS, not contracted out to Live Well Southwest or any other private company. 3. For the NHS in Devon to commit to a strategy for raising awareness among medical professionals regarding a. The underdiagnosis of autism and ADHD in many sections of the population based on gender, class, race and ethnicity. b. The less well-known presentations of autism and ADHD, for example, inattentive symptoms of ADHD. c. Common comorbidities and how they mask symptoms of autism and ADHD in patients, for example, how autism is often missed in patients with other disabilities, or how ADHD is extremely common in patients already diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. We didn't expect to get all our demands met. It was a deliberate tactic to say what we really wanted and ask for the earth, allowing them to think they had bargained us down when it came to negotiations. Eventually the CCG agreed to meet with us. The CCG, now One Devon Integrated Care Services, is the local body that makes decisions about who provides NHS services and how much money they get. We ran our meeting with the CCG the same way we would have had a meeting with a, the boss, from the Solidarity Federation's workplace organiser training. For example, making sure we all spoke so there was no one person to pick on. This pressure from media attention, union support and a grassroots group that was clearly not going away won the day. We had plans to escalate to direct action, but in the end that wasn't needed. Assessments have started again, and they agreed to put £500,000 more a year into the service. Some of our demands weren't met, running as an NHS service. Also, some of them were agreed to in theory, making general practitioners better informed. But we haven't had the energy as a group to follow up and make that happen. I think winning the main demand too fast meant that there wasn't time to get used to acting together as an organising committee and also meant few other people knew about the campaign, as we hadn't called for any action from the public. I don't know what lessons to draw from that, but friends are already reporting that they have appointments with the new services, so all in all it was a good thing. After several NHS community organising campaigns in the South West, it seems like the following are key to a successful campaign. 1. Combine community and worker organising, and do it as a group so they can't identify ringleaders to sack. Two. Persistence is key. Show them you aren't going away. The kind of action we take is less important than just showing you can keep it up day in, day out, until you win. 3. Escalate, but slowly. Show that you are willing to take things further, e.g. direct action. But build up to it a bit at a time. Remember, persistence is key. Examples we've tried or planned in the Southwest include getting supporters to email the CCG all on the same day to fill up their inboxes, disrupting community consultations, disrupting CZG meetings with noise demos, or even storming the building during a protest. The campaign group has now become more of a support group for the people involved, which is no bad thing. You can reach us on Devon Assessment Campaign at riseup.net if you need to get in touch. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.